It's come time for our first message. Brother Stacy Lane is no stranger around here. It's my, uh, as far as ministry is concerned, my best friend. I love Brother Stacy. And we talk um, two or three times a week. And I call him more. He just don't answer it. <laughs> but, uh, I want to talk to Stacy every day. He's my buddy. And one time I called him and his wife answered the phone. She said, Stacy, telephone, it's your boyfriend. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Uh, he may have a man crush on me, but I don't look at him the same way. <laughs> but I do love this dear brother. He's ministered to my heart. He's often refreshed my bowels. That's what the Bible says. Often refreshed my bowels. And I thank God. Brother Stacy, you come. I've never had an introduction like that. <laughs> That'll get you ready for preaching. I assure you I have no crush on Richard Kleinard. It's hard to look at him, in fact. <laughs> blessing. I do love you, preacher. Thank God for him. He's been a blessing to my life in several ways. I appreciate his family, and how they love the Lord. and I'm just humbled to get to be here. It's one of the highlights of my year is getting to come back out here and be with this church. I tried to, we tried to work it where my wife could be here this year and um, she, the, the job that, that she works uh, for the state there it just wasn't going uh, wasn't going to happen. And I told her, I said, "Hun, if you could just come, I said those folks will minister to you just just by being there. They'll love you and encourage you." And I thank God for that spirit and that heart in Amen. this church. Amen. I appreciate what I've been getting in these services. How the Lord has been speaking to my heart and drawing me unto Himself. The good preaching of the Word of God. I don't know, further I go, it seems like preaching like we're hearing uh, just stirs me, makes me want to be all that I can be for God. And you almost feel like sometimes you ain't even called when you hear a man like we've been hearing preach as they've been preaching and I just want to thank God for it. It's the Lord helping us, drawing us unto Himself. We need that in these days. How glorious it is. And then this singing. My mind. I love the Watson family. They've helped my heart and this new couple, I've just become acquainted with them this week. Thank God for it. I know we don't believe it. About the only hope we got is if God ruins us. That's right. You're right, brother. Yeah, right. You're right. That's right. Now the Lord Jesus taught that. Yeah. He said, except the corn of wheat fall in the ground and die. You're right. It abides alone. But if it die, yeah. somebody said a dead man doesn't have a future. No, that is his future. If it die, Jesus said, it brings forth much fruit. The Lord's ways with us is to get us strapped to an altar somewhere, and drain everything that's in us, that's of us, out of us. So that he can channel his life through us. And that takes the miracle of God. Let's open the word of God to Ephesians 3 tonight. I want to read a few verses and just try to bring what's in my heart. Get out of the way and let Preacher Larry Winkler come. 
one of the great honors of my life is to be able to say that uh, I pastored a church where Brother Larry Winkler pastored one time. And then uh, Brother Dana Williams pastored there. And they, it just kind of, when they got to me, they just was down at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> and didn't have nowhere else to go. But uh, that's a privilege for me to be able to say that. And then to be in the meeting with these men, how glorious. Ephesians 3 verse 13. Paul said, wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause... I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now, Paul, what are you praying about? The prayers of the Bible teach us how to pray. I love the prayers of Paul. He said that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. I don't really know what to call this tonight. I've got about four or five different titles. I like the thought of a, a prayer to experience the triune God. I was wondering what you're looking to get out of this meeting. What are you looking for to happen in your life? What are you looking for your church? I'll tell you, there's great prospects for us tonight. Yes, sir. I heard a man say years ago, there's a whole lot more to be had than some people are getting. Yeah. <laughs> Paul's burden for this church, he prayed earlier in the epistle, now he's praying again. Somebody said about the only time you get prayed for in a Baptist church is when you get sick. I'm sure Paul prayed about physical needs, but what's on his heart and mind is not the issue of the body. It's the issue of the spirit. I don't know why it is. I've never heard anybody say, Preacher, would you pray for brother so-and-so? He's got hopeless. Preacher, would you pray for me? I'm running low on love. Yeah. Yeah, preacher. <laughs> Seemed like the amount, it just about amounts to just, uh, somebody said, an anatomy study on a Wednesday night prayer meeting. Every body part's called out. <laughs> You're right. You're right, preacher. Yes. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. If I get sick, I want God's people praying for me. 
I want to tell you something, there's needs in this room tonight in our lives that go beyond what people can see. There's things inside of us that God only can fix, that He can address. I love Paul's prayers. I think he was a praying man. I think he was mighty in prayer. There ain't no doubt about it. Paul knew how to get a hold of God. This marked his life. In fact, this is, this is what marks every believer. They was scared of Paul when he made a profession. Yeah. It's about like Osama bin Laden yeah. coming into your church, wanting to join the church. I'd have to really pray about it. Yeah. <laughs> and they got worried about him. They kind of kept him at a distance. But the Lord nudged a man by the name of Ananias. And thank God for these guys that kind of in the shadows that God uses. Here's what the Lord said about him. Here's the mark of his life. Here's the mark of every believer. God said, Behold, he prayeth. Now you'd sooner find a living, non-breathing human than you would a non-praying believer. Somebody said, Ain't brother so-and-so a praying Christian? Well, what other kind is there? There is no non-praying Christian. I know that's a double negative, but you get the point. Paul said that God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Lord saved me. I was amazed. I was a heathen, wasn't brought up in church, didn't know anything about the gospel. The Lord saved me. I was overwhelmed with two things going on in my life. The first thing is this Bible become real to me. God spoke to me. God was talking to me through His Word. And I found myself talking to God. Oh, we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. But we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Abba. That's a Hebrew word. It's an infant's word. They say it doesn't require any teeth to use it. (laughs) Just what comes out of a little baby's mouth when he don't know how to say anything. Ah, but that's I hated ladies, but that's generally the first thing that comes out of their mouth. Papa, daddy. That's what it means. It means daddy. It means papa. Oh, don't you thank God tonight. When the Lord saved you, He put in your heart a cry and a longing and a desire for God to know God and to talk to God. Oh, Paul's praying for the church at Ephesus. He's got a burden that they might know what it is to experience all that the Spirit's up to in their life. He's praying that they might know what it is to know the indwelling life of Christ. He's praying that they might know all the fullness of God. Somebody said, oh, it sounds like a big order. I want to tell you that's within prospects for every one of us. I believe it's what God had in mind for the Ephesian Christians. It wouldn't be in the Bible if He didn't. And I believe it's what God has in mind for you and me tonight. It's God's people. I want to tell you tonight, We don't have to go around looking like our driver's license all the time. We don't have to have a firecracker life with a dynamite gospel. So many people are theologically rich, but they're experientially poor. They know a whole lot, but they ain't experiencing very much. Don't have much of a testimony. Don't have much victory. Don't have much of a shout. Don't have any prayer in their life. Don't have any gospel witness in their life. I want to say to you, that's not Christian living. As Paul, in these words and so many other places, I think this is Christian living. Oh, hear me tonight. Look at what he said. He said, I'm praying that God would grant you, that He would give you, According to the riches of His glory, look at this, that they might know what it is to experience the strength of the Spirit of God in their life, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. 
And he's not talking about physical strength. He's talking about that life of God that is within us, that he might work in such a way that we become stronger in the spirit. The word means to be brought to the point of power. Oh, we live in days that requires the power of God and the touch of God on our life to be strengthened, empowered, to grow strong with might. What does he mean there? He means divine ability. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about miraculous power. He's talking about the force and the ability of God in our life. Now he's going to talk about God's ability in verse number 20. Thank God for it. That's the basis on which he prays. But oh, think about what God can do in our lives. Think about that tonight. Not what we can do because we commit and because we're diligent or because we uh, somehow discipline ourselves. But Paul's praying simply on the hope and the merits that God can do something like this. That the Holy Ghost can do something in our lives that we can't do for ourselves. That the Holy Ghost can do in us what Baptists can't do. And what religion can't do. And what the preacher can't do. And what the Sunday school can't do. But God's Holy Ghost active in our lives. He means to be strong in the strength of another. Oh, thank God for that tonight. You had not got to run in your own juice. You had not got to run in your own power. We don't have to pray in our strength. We don't have to pray in our ability. We can pray in the Holy Ghost. We don't have to preach in our ability. Paul said it was a demonstration of the Spirit. When he got done, you was more impressed by what God had just done than what Paul had done. Amen. Amen. There is such a thing as the anointing the Holy Ghost. And I am convinced that every God-called man, God anoints him. No such a thing as an unanointed God-called man. There's divine ability that comes with that strength of that anointing. And oh, think about it tonight, what God could do if we could get in the current of the power of God, get beyond ourselves into the strength of God. That's the only way our Lord Jesus got here. You remember he came, the angel came and made that announcement to Mary over there. Thou art highly favored among women. Boy, by the time he got done talking to Mary, she had one response. Now, it's not like Zacharias was earlier in the chapter when he said, how shall this be? He, he wasn't for it. No. He's kind of uh, objecting to everything yeah. that God was up to. But Mary said, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She said, be it unto me according to thy word. She said, Lord, here I am. I'm open for it. I'm a candidate for it. Just tell me how you want to do it. And God had one answer for her. It's the same answer he has for you and me tonight. God said the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That's how we got the Lord Jesus Christ here in the flesh. And that's the only way the Lord Jesus Christ is still going to get here in our flesh. It's going to take the power of God. It's going to take an inner working of the Holy Ghost taking us beyond ourselves. He's praying they might know something about the inner strengthening of the Spirit. He's praying they might know something about the indwelling life of Christ. Look at what he said there. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now, don't get the impression that he's praying that they would become Christians. A lot of times we use this kind of language that Christ will dwell in us and get in somebody, whatever, that they might become a Christian. That's what constitutes us as Christians for sure. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So said the Word of God. And the Lord moves in. Thank God for that. But what Paul's praying, they are Christians. What does he mean that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith? That word dwell is significant here. And what it means is that he might just be at home. 
that he could just settle down and be himself. In too many of our lives, the Lord is present, but he's not preeminent. I can't help, I'm thinking about those disciples when they brought the Lord on, on board the boat. Do you remember that? And they got out there in a storm and the Bible said Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. What was he doing in the back of the ship? I won't tell you why he's in the back of the ship. That's where they put him. The experienced fishermen. They lived on them waters of the Galilee. They knew those waters. They knew how to boat. They knew how to sail. They brought the Lord on board and said, Lord, we got a special seat just for you right back here. Now that's where he'll be if that's where you want him to be. Church of Laodicea stood there. He's wanting to get in. Oh, think about it. And even tonight, he wants to be himself in our life. He wants to be at home in our hearts. That our lives may be a temple of God. That our hearts may be fit for the King. I'm glad to have my girls with me tonight. This year, they get to come out this year, but I remember when Lacey was little, we'd go visit somebody. They'd say, oh, make yourself at home, preacher. I said, don't say that. <laughs> she is little. She'd be in there in the kitchen digging around. We'd be sitting in the den. We'd hear something with my wife. I said, you better go get her. <laughs> She'd be back in the bedrooms. Yeah. You'd be in the refrigerator. What's she doing? Making herself at home. And we say that when we have guests, but we don't really mean it. Does that mean they're going to take their shoes off and their feet's going to stink? But oh, think about what our lives would look like if the Lord Jesus could be at home in our hearts. That it could be everything that he is in all of me doing all that he can do. That's holiness. That's holiness. The whole Christ in the whole life. Just him being all himself. Unfolded. Boy, he went to his hometown. You remember the Bible said he did no mighty works there because of their unbelief. They wouldn't let him be Jesus. He walked off and left them. A pastor used to have a say, and I quote it. Preacher Wade Huntley, some of you remember him. He said, if you don't want God around here, he'll go down the road and bless a black holiness outfit. (laughs) He's just looking for somewhere where he can be himself. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth that he might show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. All God needs is an available life. Not an able life, but an available life. All God needs is an open door. All God needs is an open heart. He said, open your mouth wide. And he said, I will fill it. And what happens when the Lord's at home in my heart? You know what it does? It brings in my life a sense of His amazing, wonderful love, His unexplainable love, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, He said, you may be able to comprehend with all saints. Boy, isn't it good that you can get in on everything that all the saints are getting in on. Oh, I like that. He said down there in verse number 20, he's able to do above all that we ask. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the apostles. He's talking about these that we so highly revere. Boy, they could pray and get great things from God. 
But he's able to do for you and me exactly what he did for them. That with all the saints, you and I might be able to enter into exactly what they've experienced and tasted. Aren't you glad tonight that you're not a second class Christian just because you're in the 21st century? There's as much of God going around as ever has been. Might be able to comprehend a little bit, just see a little bit of these great dimensions, the immeasurable love of God. And he said in verse number 19 that you just might be able to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. You know some things that you don't understand. You can experience something that you can't explain. I'm not very smart. There's a whole lot I don't know. I don't understand. Old Vance Havner used to say, I don't understand how electricity works, but he said, I ain't going to sit around in the dark trying to figure it out. I don't understand everything there is to know about God's amazing grace. Oh, I don't want to sit around in the dark. I don't want to be distant from it. I want to taste the Lord and see that He is good. I want to drink from a fountain that will never run dry. And feast on manna that comes from on high. Thank God that's what He has for us tonight, beloved. Hey, there's as much for us tonight as there ever has been in God's treasure house. Know the love of Christ that passes all knowledge. He sheds abroad in our hearts, the Holy Ghost sheds abroad in our hearts the love of Christ. It's not just love toward others, certainly that's involved. What does he mean by that? The active ministry of the Holy Ghost in your life and my life causes us to know how much we're loved. Amen. Amen. I don't mean to be offensive. If you are a red-headed stepchild, I wouldn't injure you or insult you in any means. I may look like a red-headed stepchild, but I ain't getting treated like one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got a place at the table. And God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. God wants us to know how much we're loved. Jesus said, as the fathers loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. That's what that little Shulamite learned about King Solomon. I'm his and he is mine. But before it was all over, she got to the place in her Christian life where she realized that she'd failed him so many times. She'd come up so short. But thank God she was still loved. I am my beloved's and his desire is still toward me. Hallelujah. Thank God. I love that old song, He Loves Me, He Loves Me. Even when I'm bad, He loves me. Even when I'm sad. Amen. That little church I got saved in over yonder in East Tennessee, Miss Ann, Sister Ann, she had them 1960s glasses that kind of old black rim come around to a teardrop lens look like, you know. You know I'm talking, some of you remember that. Yeah, yeah. Boy, she'd hit that and she'd start singing. Why did He go? To Calvary. Boy, it's good to have memories like that of the saints. Oh, God. And all them people, they love me to God. Hallelujah. Just wall to wall love, wall to wall glory. Thank God they didn't, they couldn't tell you what Baptist was doing in Nashville. Oh, they knew what God was up to. Why was his life's blood shed for me? There's just one reason, she said. He loves me. He loves me, thank God. When I'm bad, he loves me. When I'm sad, 
Oh, hallelujah tonight. We're alive, folks. God isn't just tolerating us tonight. Hey, His attention's on us. His eyes upon us and His ears open unto our cry. All of heaven's directed in this place tonight. All the attention of God is in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, God, I got to quit. As a boy, I'd get to liking a girl. Y'all never did this. I'd pick one of them daisies, Brother Chad, and I'd say, she loves me. She loves me not. She lo- always ended up on, she don't love me, but I'd get me another and pick it again. <laughs> You ain't got to do that tonight, beloved. That's right, Hallelujah. God's affections are toward us. The devil in hell wants to make you feel like you're an isolated social accident that you don't matter. That if you was God's child, these kinds of things wouldn't be going on in your life. Oh, hear me tonight, God. God has divine affections. He's got deep affections for God's people tonight. And nothing Paul said will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praying they might know something about the strength of the Spirit, the indwelling life of Christ. He's praying they might know something about all the fullness of God. Hallelujah. It's one thing to be filled. It's even better to be filled with all. It's best to be filled with all the fullness of God. I don't like the sensation of running low. I don't know if it's inexperienced youth or not, used to. It may have just been a negative cash flow. I used to think that card run better when it got below a quarter of a tank. You ever thought that? You run out a couple of times, you got to walk a little bit. You start realizing it runs better on the top end. We ain't got to run on fumes, folks. We ain't got to run on memories. Hallelujah! That you might be filled with all the fullness of God, all that God is and all that God has. To be as complete as God is. What is he talking about? He's just being satisfied. How many really satisfied people do you know? As an old preacher years ago used to make this statement. He said, I'd hate to stick my head in heaven having never been filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, Paul, really? Are you serious? Do you know who you're talking to? Who you're talking about? These Ephesians, they were idolaters. You want them to be strengthened with might by the Spirit of God in the inner man? You want them to be a temple, a home for God to live in? And you want them to know something about the fullness of God? What in the world makes you think that's possible? Don't you know we're just a bunch of Tennessee, North Carolina rednecks? It's a big order, Paul. Well, you've been awful bold. I want you to see this and I'm going to quit. On what basis Paul makes this prayer? He loads it up at the beginning and then he backs it up at the end of the prayer. Two 
big foundation stones that he bases this prayer on. He said in verse number 14, I bow my knees. Both of them. On one knee, verse number 16, that he would grant you according on the basis of the riches of his glory. God's abundance. Got one knee on that. There's plenty there. But he's got his knee on another thing there in verse number 20. Reason I'm asking this, Paul said, is I know who's a listening. Unto him that is able. Able to do what, Paul? Able to do exceeding abundantly. Listen now. Above all that we could ever ask. He said, God will even do more than this. That sounds pretty good to me to be strengthened with mind by spirit in the inner man. To be at home, for God to be at home in my heart and to be filled with all the fullness of God. That sounds pretty good. Paul said, I'm talking to a God who can do beyond that. He can take you beyond all of that. He can take you into territory you didn't know existed. The old Irish used to say, deeper depths and higher heights in the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua, God come to him and said, Joshua was old and well stricken in age. He done went in, claimed some territory, advanced conquest after conquest into the Canaan land. But it came to him and said, Joshua, there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. (laughs) Hallelujah. God's got it to give. That's why he's asking God for it. I'm going to tell you something tonight. I might, I might talk to old Bill Gates about $10,000, but probably not Brother Richard. No. Good idea, bro. Huh? I wouldn't talk to me about it. You might be better off to talk to one of these other fellas. They got it. They got it to give. And Paul's talking to the God that's got it to give. The one who's rich in glory. Oh, listen, thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring his grace and power such that none can ever ask too much. Have you ever asked God for strength in the inner man? He's got it to give. Have you ever asked God for a deeper sense of his immeasurable love in your life? Oh, he's got it to give. If you ever ask God for all the fullness of God, He's got it to give. Amen. Old J. Wilbur Chapman used to tell the story of a man who, who, who got right with God in one of his meetings. And this, this brother stood up, testified in the meeting uh, that he'd, he'd ran away from home as a young man. Got away from God, got away from home, got away from the gospel, and he was walking on the streets of Philadelphia one day, walked up to a stranger, tapped him on the shoulder, and the man turned around, he didn't, wouldn't even look him in the face, and he said, Sir, would you mind? You've got a few pennies you can spare. The old man turned and looked at him and started crying. He said, Son, is that you? He said, Pennies? He said, You come home, you've got everything I've got. You can have everything I've got. Oh, hey, you know what old Hudson Taylor used to say? He said, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He said, we need not be vegetarians. Oh, I read this text again yesterday in my Bible reading. And then the, 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 the writer, Psalm 50, Asaph said, Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. He said, I know all the fowls of the mountains and the, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. And God said, If I was hungry, I wouldn't tell thee. He said, For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. God's got it to give. 
And it's within his range of ability to do it. That word able just simply means he can. It's translated in the New Testament like this other places as can. He can. He's the can-do God. He can do this. Let me finish with this. I read about William Randolph Hearst. who had a fortune of art, rare artifacts, collections, treasures from around the world. One day he got to reading about something he didn't think he had. Never seen it. Some valuable items. And so he sent one of his servants, one of his workers out to look for it. And after months of searching, the agent came back and reported back to Hearst and told him that he'd found it. He got it in his possession. Oh, he said, great, great, great. I want to see it. He said, it's in your own warehouse. You had it the whole time. Didn't even know that he had it. Looking for something that he didn't even know that he had that was within reach. I don't know what you've got on your mind tonight, what it is you've got your eye on, what it is you're interested in. But hear me tonight, I want you to know God's got it. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the answer is within the triune God. I believe the triune God saves, and I believe the triune God sanctifies. All at work in our lives at one and the same time. Come on around, preacher, I'm through.